saw many plants and animals for the very first time, and his godmother gave him special spectacles and ears to observe all the things he saw. He saw another little boy, and finally realized how useless his own legs are, and faced that hard truth. Then he made dear friends with a skylark, who has made a home outside the hopeless tower and is keeping Prince Dolor company. That is where we will pick up for chapter 7. Seeing she looked 
like a less miserable and ugly woman, he did not shrink from her as usual. He did not now. Nurse, dear nurse, said he, I don't mean to vex you, but tell me, what is a king? Shall I ever be one? When she began to think less of herself and more of the child, the woman's courage increased. The idea came to her. What harm would it be, even if he did know his own history? Perhaps he ought to know it, for there had been various ups and downs, usurpations, revolutions, and restorations in no man's land, as in most other countries. Something might happen. Who could tell? Changes might occur. Possibly a crown would even yet be set upon those pretty fair curls, which she began to think prettier than ever when she saw the imaginary coronet upon them. She sat down, considering her oath never to say a word to Prince Dolor about himself, would be broken if she were to take a pencil and write what was to be told. A mere quibble, a mean, miserable quibble. But then she was a miserable woman, more to be pitied than scorned. After long doubt, and with great trepidation, she put her fingers to her lips, and taking the prince's slate, with the sponge tied to it, ready to rub out the writing in a minute, she wrote, You are a king. Prince Dolor started. His face grew pale, and then he flushed all over. He held himself erect. Lame as he was, anybody could see he was born to be a king. Hush, said the nurse as he was beginning to speak. And then, terribly frightened all the while, people who have done wrong always are frightened, she wrote down in a few hurried sentences his history. How his parents had died, his uncle had usurped his throne and sent him to end his days in this lonely tower. I, too, added she, bursting into tears, unless, indeed, you could get out into the world and fight for your rights like a man, and fight for me also, my prince, that I may not die in this desolate place. Poor old nurse, said the boy compassionately, for somehow, boy as he was, when he heard that he was born to be a king, he felt like a man, like a king, who could afford to be tender because he was strong. He scarcely slept that night, and even though he heard his little lark singing in the sunrise, he barely listened to it. Things more serious and important had taken possession of his mind. Suppose, thought he, I were to do as she says, and go out into the world no matter how it hurts me, the world of people, active people, as active as that boy I saw. They might only laugh at me, poor helpless creature that I am, but still I might show them I could do something. At any rate, I might go and see if there were anything for me to do. Godmother, help me. It was so long since he had asked her help that he was hardly surprised when he got no answer. Only the little lark outside the window sang louder and louder, and the sun rose, flooding the room with light. Prince Dolor sprang out of bed and began dressing himself, which was hard work, for he was not used to it. He had always been accustomed to depend upon his nurse for everything. But I must now learn to be independent, thought he. Fancy a king being dressed like a baby. So he did the best he could, awkwardly but cheerily, and then he leaped to the corner where lay his traveling cloak, untied it as before, and watched it unrolling itself, which it did rapidly, with a hearty good will, as if quite tired of idleness. So was Prince Dolor, or felt as if he were. He jumped into the middle of it, and set his charm, and was out through the skylight immediately. Goodbye, pretty lark, he shouted, as he passed it on the wing, still warbling its carol to the newly risen sun. You have been my pleasure, my delight. Now I must go and work. Sing to old nurse till I come back again. Perhaps she'll hear you, perhaps she won't, but it will do her good all the same. Goodbye. But as the clung hung irresolute in the air, he suddenly remembered that he had, he had not determined where to go. Indeed, he did not know, and there was nobody to tell him. Godmother, he cried, in much perplexity, you know what I want. At least I hope you do, for I hardly do myself. Take me where I ought to go. Show me whatever I ought to see. Never mind what I like to see. As a sudden image came into his mind that he might see many painful and disagreeable things. But this journey was not for pleasure as before. He was not a baby now to do nothing but play. Big boys do not always play. Nor men neither. They work. Thus much Prince Dolor knew, though very little more. As the cloak started off, traveling faster than he had ever known it to do, through the skyland and cloudland over freezing mountain tops and desolate stretches of forest, and smiling cultivated plains and great lakes that seemed to him almost as shoreless as the sea, he was often rather frightened, but he crouched down, silent and quiet. What was the use of making a fuss? And wrapping himself up in his bearskin, he waited for what was to happen. After some time, he heard a murmur in the distance. 
increasing more and more till it grew like the hum of a gigantic hive of bees, and, stretching his chin over the rim of his cloak, Prince Dolor saw, far, far below him, yet with his gold spectacles and silver ears on, he could distinctly hear and see what. Most of us have some time or other visited a great metropolis, have wandered through its network of streets, lost ourselves and selves in its crowds of people, looked up at its tall rows of houses, its grand public buildings, churches, and squares. Also, perhaps, we have peeped into its miserable little back alleys, where dirty children play in gutters all day and half the night. Even young boys go about picking pockets, with nobody to tell them it is wrong except the policeman, and he simply takes them off to prison. And all this wretchedness is close behind the grandeur, like two sides of the leaf of a book. An awful sight is a large city, seen anyhow from anywhere. But suppose you were to see it from the upper air. With your eyes and ears open, you could take in everything at once. What would it look like? How would you feel about it? I hardly know myself. Do you? Prince Dolor had need to be a king. That is, a boy with a kingly nature. To be able to stand such a sight without being utterly overcome. But he was very much bewildered. As bewildered as a blind person who is suddenly made to see... He gazed down on the city below him, and then put his hand over his eyes. I can't bear to look at it. It is so beautiful, so dreadful, and I don't understand it, not one bit. There is nobody to tell me about it. I wish I had somebody to speak to. Do you? Then pray speak to me. I was always considered good at conversation. The voice that squeaked out this reply was an excellent imitation of the human one, though it came only from a bird. No lark this time, however, but a great black and white creature that flew into the cloak and began walking round and round on the edge of it with a dignified stride one foot before the other, like any unfeathered biped you could name. I haven't the honour of your acquaintance, sir, said the boy politely. Ma'am, if you please, I am a mother bird and my name is Mag and I shall be happy to tell you everything you want to know, for I know a great deal and I enjoy talking. My family is of great antiquity. We have built in this palace for hundreds, that is to say, dozens of years. I am intimately acquainted with the king, the queen, and the, the little princes and princesses, also the maids of honor, and all the inhabitants of the city. I talk a good deal, but I always talk sense, and I dare say I should be exceedingly useful to a poor little ignorant boy like you. I am a prince, said the other gently. All right, and I am a magpie. You will find me a most respectable bird. I have no doubt of it, was the polite answer, though he thought in his own mind that Mag must have a very good opinion of herself, but she was a lady and a stranger, so of course he was civil to her. She settled herself at his elbow, and began to chatter away, pointing out with one skinny claw while she balanced herself on the other, every object of interest, evidently believing, as no doubt all its inhabitants did, that there was no capital in the world like the great metropolis of Nomansland. I have not seen it, and therefore cannot describe it, so we will just take it upon trust, and suppose it to be, like every other fine city, the finest city that was ever built. Mag said so, and of course she knew. Nevertheless, there were a few things in it which surprised Prince Dolor, and as he had said, he could not understand them at all. One half the people seemed so happy and busy, hurrying up and down the full streets, or driving lazily along the parks in their grand carriage, while the other half were so wretched and miserable. Can't the world be made a little more equal? I would try to do it if I were a king. But you're not the king, only a little goose of a boy, returned the magpie loftily. And I'm here not to explain things, only to show them. Shall I show you the royal palace? It was a very magnificent palace. It had terraces and gardens, battlements and towers. It extended over acres of ground and had in its rooms enough to accommodate half the city. Its windows looked in all directions, but none of them had any particular view except a small one, high up toward the roof, which looked out on the beautiful mountains. But since the queen died there, it had been closed, boarded up indeed, the magpie said. It was so little and inconvenient that nobody cared to live in it. Besides, the lower apartments, which had no view, were magnificent, worthy of being inhabited by the king. I should like to see the king, said Prince Dolor. 